Penny is in recovery for drug and alcohol addictions and drank while pregnant with both her son and oldest daughter. My life before I went into recovery, you know, it, it, it wasn't a life, you know, it was just cocaine and alcohol. That's all I knew. After Penny gave birth to her son Liddell, she tried to get clean and sober, but she quickly relapsed. I felt lonely, I felt alone, you know, and I felt helpless, hopeless, you know, a lot of days when I woke up. It wasn't until Penny's second child, Deja, was born that she was able to make a change. I wanted to be a mother, but I didn't know how. So I said, um, if I get clean, I can learn how, you know, but I knew I couldn't learn being where I was. Soon after Deja was born, Penny entered Avery House, a treatment center and halfway house for women with children. Liddell and Deja came to live with her as she started her recovery. And that's where I learned to be a mom. We went through therapy, you know, and it was wonderful. I mean, it, it taught me so much about being a mom. Penny graduated from Avery House and built a life for herself and her children. Still in recovery, she is raising three children as a single mom, one day at a time. It was a big change because there was a lot of things I had to do differently. You know, I couldn't use anymore. Um, I had to buy diapers. I had to change diapers. Um, I had to teach positive language, you know, instead of cursing and screaming and hollering. Um, I had to talk very low, calm. I was never used to that. I'm still not. As Penny has become the kind of mother she wants to be, she has noticed that both Liddell and Deja are struggling with issues that concern her. Liddell's behavioral difficulties first surfaced when he started school. He was in um, Head Start, and, um, you know, the teacher would, she, she was sending notes home. You know, Liddell had an outburst. Um, Liddell ran, you know, he was running off. Um, you know, he's screaming to the top of his lungs. Liddell was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Penny worked with his doctor to find medications and other strategies to help him in school and at home. As he grew older, he became very troubled emotionally. Deeply depressed following the deaths of several close family members, he needed hospitalized. Penny has since enrolled him in a special school to meet his needs and help him manage his emotions. When I get very mad, it feels like a volcano inside me. If I don't help my son now, where is he going to be in five, ten years? And I knew he was, he was going to be in jail or dead because of, you know, his, his anger streak. You know, he, he doesn't go from you know, being upset to being angry to, you know, just dealing with it. He goes, zoom. Penny is concerned about Deja as well. There's something going on with her too. You know, I'm kinda, you know, I'm watching her and, and she's very busy and she's very provoking. She's, you know, and I, I mean, I ask her occasionally, are, are you upset about something? And she'll, no, you know, I can tell. In addition to problems at home, Deja struggles with certain subjects in school, particularly math. She has also developed a chronic urinary tract infection. She's had it for two years. Unbelievable. I've never heard of a child having that for two years. And, you know, and I'm, we, I've been through so many tests and doctors, you know, because I'm like, you know, what do I need to do? Recently, Penny learned about FASD at a conference for women in recovery. After hearing the stories of birth mothers and their children, Penny started to wonder if drinking during pregnancy had affected her children. She has shared this concern with her children's doctors. When I go to those doctors, I need to be totally honest. Because if I don't, you know, they're gonna think, okay, well, you know, is, is this hereditary? Does your mother, your father, you know? And not, by not telling him it's me, it was me, you know, her symptoms could be totally different, you know. They could end up giving her the wrong medication for the wrong thing. So, you know, they, I've, I've, I've learned to be honest with my children's doctors. And, you know, by being honest, you know, I get 
correct information. Penny learned that the kinds of problems she sees in her children could be associated with FASD, not inherited, but caused solely by drinking during pregnancy. Penny wants to have them evaluated. Whether it has anything to do with it, I don't know. But I just know that now that I understand, I want to be sure, you know? Because if, if it is, I need to know what to do. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have to live with the guilt that I knew something was wrong with my child and I didn't do anything about it. We know that the two most important factors in the life of children that have been prenatally exposed to alcohol are number one, life in a stable and nurturing environment, and number two, getting an early diagnosis. If you as the parent really feel deep down inside that your child's just not getting it, that you just don't have the answers, that you're struggling, you know, just to make the day, you know, go relatively smoothly, that you're always seeming to um, have di difficulties at school. I would really encourage parents um, to get a diagnosis if at all possible. Identifying FASD early can help a child lead a happier and more productive life. But admitting that you drank during pregnancy can be a very difficult step. You really need to suit what you do to where you are in your recovery. And the early stages of recovery are very challenging. They're hard. It takes courage to do it. Some women seek services for their children without revealing what they know about the possible cause of their children's problems. They can take steps to get their children's services while they continue to work on their own recovery. I couldn't talk about alcohol, being alcoholic, drinking during pregnancy, but I learned to talk about education and therapies and what he needed and how he was different from my older son, how he was different from the other kids that I saw. Um, and so I, I learned to navigate the, the special education and related services community before he was diagnosed or I had to tell any secrets. Um, I still needed to tell those secrets at the end of the day at my support group um, or to somebody because they were still secrets and I was going to drink if I didn't if I didn't stay honest with somebody about them because I still knew and I had to still hold my head up um, to try and get him what he needed but he he got the he got what he needed um, and so did I. It is easy to let blame and shame get in the way of helping your children. But taking responsibility is an important part of recovery and a source of hope for your family. They never have any intention on hurting anybody. It's an addiction, it's a disease, it's the disease of alcoholism. So whether they want it to stop or not, they don't have any control to do that. So the accountability and the responsibility part of it all is standing up and saying, yes, I did this and I want to change this. I want to do something about this now. Um, I want to help my children. I want to help myself. I want to better myself. Um, and it's crucial to recovery. It's, I mean, it's, it could lead you back out there if you didn't start taking accountability and recognizing and being aware what your drug and your alcohol has done to your family and yourself. Knowing that, um, you know, I had caused my daughter to suffer with this for the rest of her life, it really, you know, threw me into kind of a depression because it's like, I can't believe I did this to my child. You know, when I realized that I had worked my fifth step over and over and over again, and yet the one person that my drinking had harmed the most was my own daughter. And, you know, so that, that evening when I told Faith, you know, that I wouldn't blame her if she was so angry with me that she never wanted to talk to me again. And, you know, my daughter put her arms around me and said, you know, Mom, why would I hate you? She said, why would I be angry with you? She said, you didn't drink because you wanted to hurt me. She said, you drank because you didn't know any better. And she said, and I'm just glad to know that I'm not stupid. Do you mean... You drank alcohol when you were pregnant with me? And it was one of those, like, time stood still, eternal instant things. He's asking me a yes or no question. He doesn't want to hear 
disease models or progression or what I knew or didn't know or mental illness. He doesn't want to, he, he's asking me a yes or no question. And, uh, and I say, yes, I did. I hope, I hope someday you can forgive me for that. And we have this thing in our house, like it's not okay um, to ask somebody to forgive you or to apologize just to get out of trouble. That's not okay to do. So if the kids think like somebody's apologizing to get out of trouble, they should say, are you really sorry? So the person has to stop and think for a minute. So Michael, because I've trained him that it's okay to do this, says to me, well, are you really sorry? And I'm driving, there's nowhere to pull over. There's, there's nowhere to run away. It's me and Mike in the car and the question. And I say, yes, I am. I am really, I'm really sorry. I hope one day you can forgive me for that. While we're going, while we're figuring all this out. And, uh, you know, I look over at him and as only Michael can be, he says to me, I don't mind. I don't mind. It, which is this, a hundred percent typical Michael answer. He's not saving this information to hold against me later. He has no resentments or grudges. He loves his mom. He has my undivided attention. Life is good to him. He, I don't mind. He says, I don't mind. I love you, mommy. And so we go down and we do the rest of the day. We do the rest of the day. and. And I'm next to him and I have this voice. It was so clear, I almost looked over my shoulder if I hadn't been driving, that said to me, if he can forgive you this, who are you to not forgive yourself? Thousands of children are born every year with birth defects due to alcohol exposure. Many of these brain changes affect learning and behavior, but are otherwise invisible. While the changes to the brain and other organs cannot be repaired, there is a lot parents in recovery can do to help their children. In part two of Recovering Hope, more mothers step forward to speak out about FASD and share their stories of hope and recovery. Follow Penny as she takes her children to be evaluated. Meet a young woman who refused to let FASD keep her from pursuing her dreams and visit with a new mother in recovery who is learning how to help her affected son. 